Good evening, welcome to the Jesus Movement Live. Welcome to everybody who's here with me. And thank you for everyone who's joining us online. Tonight we're continuing on with our series from the book of Matthew. This is lesson 19. And tonight's lesson is called Jesus Sends Out the Twelve. And in this picture, there's a range of people down the bottom because the Bible tells us that there is a large volume of multitudes of people who are following Jesus. So when he sends out the twelve, he actually hasn't selected all twelve at that point. He has selected some, but not all twelve. So he literally stands there, and you can see the queue up here, and he's there going, right, Matthew, you know, Peter, and they all come up, and then he sends them out. Now there's other times where Jesus sends people out. There's a bit later when he sends out the 72. So again, you can picture that there would be a large multitude of people, and then those who were selected were then sent out again. And so Jesus sends people out this time for the first time. And so this is a significant moment because the disciples have been disciples, followers of Jesus, and they've been training and learning, and Jesus has been teaching them. And he's also been showing them the power of the Holy Spirit when it works through you in terms of healing and raising the dead, casting out demons and so on. And so now he's going to give this gift to each of the disciples to go out and do it themselves. So as you could imagine, they're probably all a bit nervous um, going out and they're going to go and meet people and they're going to have to have authority or power in front of people. And that doesn't come from within. That comes from the Lord working through us. Okay, so just a quick recap. The last lesson was from Matthew 9, verses 18 to 38, the second half. And in that we learned about how Jesus healed a dead girl and a sick woman, how he healed a blind and mute man, and how he travelled and preached in many synagogues throughout the region of the Galilee, only to tell his disciples that whilst the harvest was plentiful, the workers were few. So take note of this. This is in chapter 9. The harvest is plenty, but the workers are few. What do we see happening in chapter 10? It's not a separate story. He's now sending the workers out because he told the disciples the previous time that they were a few. In other words, he's doing it all on his own. And everyone's following him. Now he moves this authority to the disciples and suddenly there are more people going out with more results. And so chapter 10 very much, even though it's segregated in our Bibles, when it was originally written, it's part of a continuous message from Matthew. It's not separated to the chapters that we know today. And so this is a flow on of him from that previous scripture that said that the harvest was plentiful and the workers are few. So in this lesson from Matthew chapter 10, we will learn how Jesus gave authority to his 12 disciples to go out and preach the good news and to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. In other words, he's giving them the power of the Holy Spirit to work through them. This chapter provides us with the who, so in other words, who the disciples are, because when we open up with this, he literally picks and names them. The where, so in other words, he tells the disciples where they're actually to go. The what, what tasks the disciples are to do. And the how, meaning how are the disciples going to provide for themselves. And so there's a very practical element to sending people out into the field and this is what Jesus will teach us. Now as they are about to leave the side of Jesus, he also makes it clear that they will be like lambs being sent to the wolves, for they will be persecuted, and he prepares them for this and the reality of ministry. So ministry is not for the faint-hearted, because there's going to be a consequence when you're communicating with people. And Jesus makes this clear that this is going to happen to each of his disciples. So we have to ask ourselves, if you were called up and said, I want you to go here, and there's a risk that your life might be threatened, etc., etc., so this is literally what Jesus is doing with his disciples. So this chapter has much to say. So I'm going to get underway. It's actually a longer teaching than the previous three, but it's a very important, uh, uh, what we call a grouping of teaching uh, to com complete in one lesson. 
So let's get underway. We're going to go to Matthew chapter 10, verses 1 to 4 to start off with. And we'll begin by reading about the commissioning and choice of the 12 disciples that Jesus will send out. So it says, Jesus called, so this is Matthew, so we're in the book of Matthew. So this is Matthew writing or reciting what he's actually hearing Jesus say. So Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and he gave them authority. Some biblical versions say power. Uh, to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. So this is something they haven't had before. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First, Simon, who was called Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus. Simon the zealot and Judas Iscariot. Who betrayed him. What a great way to record yourself for posterity. Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Now the main feature of this list is its diversity, when you actually think about it. Jesus chose his disciples from a variety of backgrounds and life experiences. About all they had in common was their lack of privilege, as none were from families or backgrounds of high status. Jesus didn't just call the twelve, but he gave them authority or power to do what he had called them to do. In other words, there's no point in sending people out if you don't equip them first with what they need. The same principle applies today. When God calls, God equips. And this equipping may not be completely evident before the ministry begins, but it will be evident along the way. So in other words, there's some things that God gives us that we can't process ourselves before we go. Now the twelve named, with the exception of Judas, have an important role in God's plan of redemption, including future judgment, which we'll read about in Matthew chapter 19, a bit later, and in the founding of the church, which we read about in Ephesians uh, chapter 2 verse 20, and the Bible promises their position and work will be remembered throughout eternity in Revelation chapter 21 verse 14. Now this is the first and only time in Matthew that the twelve are actually called Apostles. Why? Because they're being sent out. Now, from the Greek word apostolos, the word apostle literally means the one who is sent out, like an envoy or an ambassador. Jesus sends them out and gives them authority or power, but the word apostle is also often used to represent a simple messenger of God's word. So some apostles don't go out healing or casting out demons. They literally just convey a message to someone else. Now, there are four different lists of the twelve in the New Testament. There's this one here in Matthew chapter 10. There's also one in Mark chapter 3, Luke chapter 6, and Acts chapter 1. In these lists, Peter is always, always listed first, and Judas is always, always listed last. The two pairs of brothers, Peter and Andrew, James and John, are always listed, <coughs> excuse me, are listed first, and Judas, sorry, always listed first and typically reads Peter followed by Andrew, James and John. So it gives you the order in which Jesus actually called them. Then in each list, Philip is mentioned fifth, followed by Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew. And then in each list, James, the son of Alphaeus, is mentioned ninth, followed by Thaddeus, Judas, brother of James, Simon the Zealot, and of course, Judas at the end. The order and the groupings of names suggests so there's actually three groups of four who were sent out because they're named and grouped in lots of four. So we've asked, how did they go out? Did they go out on their own? Did they go out in pairs? The answer is there was three groups of four who went out. And so they think because of the first named person that the leader of each of these groups was Peter for the first group, Philip for the second group, and James, the son of Alphaeus, was the leader of the third group. Okay, so there's a little bit of uh, information about the structure of, of the groups. Now, Bartholomew, and we have spoken about this before, but just for those listening, if they're not aware, Bartholomew is identified as the Nathaniel of John chapter 1, verse 43 to 51, and John chapter 21, verse 2, whose name was understood to be Nathaniel Bar Talmai, or Nathaniel, that means son of Talmai. So here, in the account of Matthew, we see his personal name, Nathaniel, put aside to literally be called Bar Talmai, which translates into English as 
Bartholomew. And that's where the name Bartholomew comes from. It means son of Talmai. Um, now, having identified the 12 disciples, let's now read verses 5 to 6 of chapter 10 from the book of Matthew to first learn the where, the where of the disciples to go. And we learn in this scripture that Jesus directs his disciples only to the Jewish people. So the start of the ministry is for the Jewish people only. It reads, These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the, and what does he call them? The lost sheep of Israel. Jesus was touring around the region of Galilee, teaching, preaching and helping needy people with miraculous power. And for him to send out these 12 was a conscious expansion of the ministry work he was already doing. At the end of the previous chapter, Jesus said the harvest is great, but the workers are few. And now he acts upon his word and not only sends out his disciples to minister elsewhere, but he gives them the authority or the power to heal and cast out demons as well. The commander instruction is very clear. Jesus says, do not go among the Gentiles. Now this is the pattern of the gospel, for it is said in Romans chapter 1 verse 16, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. So later the gospel will go to both the Samaritans and the Gentiles, but now it begins with the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Please understand that the emphasis of what Jesus says is not focused on the prohibition of the Gentiles, because this will actually happen later as we know, as we stand here today. But in this moment, the priority is the mission ministry to Israel itself. So God's intention was to reach the whole world, but he began with Israel. There was a lot of work to be done among the lost sheep to keep the 12 busy until they were directed to expand their ministry. They were so called because their shepherds, which are the scribes, the Pharisees and the, Phar and the priests, they had, in fact, led them astray, and that's why they're called the lost sheep of Israel. Significantly, Jesus calls the Jewish people as well the house of Israel, even though they had lost their state many decades before. So in other words, Israel is defined by its people. So in other words, he's not worried about the physical land here. He's worried about the state of his people themselves. So let's now go to Matthew chapter 10, verses 7, and the first part of verse 8 to learn what are they going to do when they go out. So Jesus says, as you go, proclaim this message. Now the proclaim is to preach. And that means that they're speaking to people who are not following the word of God. And so the lost sheep of Israel tells you that they're not practicing the word of God. They're not practicing his laws. And so they're going out to proclaim the word to these people. Verse 8, Hear, sorry, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. So there's the instructions on the what are they to do. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, and drive out demons. Now early in Matthew 4 verse 17, we were told the message of Jesus was, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. The disciples brought the same message Jesus preached, but spread it over a much broader area than Jesus came by himself. There's no mention of them preaching in the synagogues, however, like Jesus did only being scourged by whips in them that we will come to in a moment in Matthew chapter 10 verse 17. So we'll speak about this a bit later. This was a house-to-house, -house, open field, street preaching ministry in which the disciples had both a message to preach and an authority to display. And this authority to raise the dead, of course, is remarkable. And the fulfillment of it, if you want to look at it, is actually recorded in Acts 9 and Acts 20. And no doubt there are many other unrecorded instances. Now the next step that Matthew speaks of, we're going to read from Matthew chapter 10 again, verse 8b. So the second half of verse 8, right through to verse 15. 
and in this it's how they are to provide for themselves so you can see in all of this there's a structure to what jesus actually does he doesn't just say off you go he gives them the how when where and how and why so reading it says freely you have received freely you give so jesus is telling them you've been taken care of by others as my disciples and so he's saying freely you have received so in other words freely you will give in other words their work that they're going to do is not for any form of pay verse 9 do not get any gold or silver or copper to take with you in your belts no bag for the journey or extra shirt or sandals or a staff for the worker is worth his keep whatever town or village you enter search there for some worthy person and stay at their house until you leave as you enter the home give it your greeting if the home is deserving let your peace rest on it if it is not let your peace return to you if anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words leave that home or town and shake the dust off your feet truly i tell you it will be more bearable for sodom and gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town so in other words those who rejects god's workers are going to face a consequence of judgment so jesus charged his disciples nothing and he expected them to give ministry to others without charge this is the foundational principle for the command that follow and this is a quote and i quote what a scandal it is for a man to traffic with gifts which he pretends at least to have received from the holy ghost of which he is not the master but the dispenser he who preaches to get a living or to make a fortune is guilty of the most infamous sacrilege i heard of a church in america how i won't say the, the person's name but basically they just finished paying off a hundred million dollar loan for their building and this person was up on stage crying at the miracle of it all well there was no miracle 100 million dollars imagine what you could do in ministry for 100 million dollars but this is what is being talked about here jesus does not give you anything he does not expect you to receive anything for what you do we are ministering to people's hearts minds and souls not to their wallets bank accounts and residences okay so he says do not get any gold or silver or copper to take with you in your money belts so the disciples were being told to expect god and this is the point god to meet their needs and not to take any undue concern for their own needs additionally they should expect god will normally meet their needs through the inspired hospitality of others in this moment jesus gave them the lesson on the providence of god and taught them to trust in it and so this is huge right now, everyone would normally prepare to be able to do something jesus is saying go with nothing and trust that god will provide you so a big big lesson in itself now, the words of jesus were very familiar to a jewish person the talmud the oral torah says and i quote no one is to go to the temple mount with staff shoes girdle of money or dusty feet the idea is that when a man enters the temple he must make it quite clear that he has left everything which has to do with trade and business and worldly affairs behind in other words he comes before the lord basically naked just him now again part of this scripture says for the worker is worth his keep so when they came among others they were to be workers among them of course this is what paul exemplified wasn't it he took his equipment of his trade and he would work for his living along the way he wouldn't take money now the money that paul did collect he didn't keep for himself of course he took it to the church in jerusalem and so he never kept anything for himself so the idea is that they were work among them in both spiritual work and practical work we can imagine them preaching the word of god praying for people and literally helping with the farm work at the same time even though the 12 could expect their needs to be met through the people they served they should never require their needs to be met as payment this is because the foundational principle was freely you have received and freely you give and there's a parable that jesus gives us isn't it and he says he says to us you always give without 
an expectation that you'll receive something back for it. And so this is akin to that teaching. Now finally, Jesus makes a point about whether the household is worthy that they go to, or whether it's not. Those who receive the disciples could expect to be blessed. And so the words in the scripture said, let your peace come upon it. In other words, let them be blessed. But those places that refuse them could expect to be treated as Gentile towns, and that is, shake off the dust from your feet as you're leaving. And as such, we're in serious danger of judgment. Okay, so let's now go to the next portion of scripture, verses 16 to 18 from Matthew chapter 10, in which Jesus prepares his disciples for the persecution that will come. And this chapter speaks a lot about persecution. So it reads, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and be flogged in the synagogues. How do you like this? For, for, this is what you're about to do. On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. Now, you, know, you might recall I mentioned about them being whipped. And so this tells us that they're going to be flogged in the synagogue. So justice is going to be administered from a Jewish viewpoint against them by whipping them in the synagogues themselves. Okay, so this portion that says, I send you out like sheep among wolves. So Jesus freely and honestly warns his disciples that they will face persecution. Because they went without protection, he sent them as sheep in the midst of wolves. Now this is quite an odd notion because we normally talk about sending sheep, we don't, sorry, uh, since we see in the natural world that the sheep, they feed will far outnumber the wolves who are so fierce. And yet here we say sending sheep amongst the wolves. So in other words, we're sending a minority of sheep amongst a majority of wolves, which is not the natural order of things. The next portion of that verse says, therefore be as shrewd as snakes and innocent as doves. Now, despite the vulnerable position they have as sheep among wolves, the followers of Jesus were not to defend themselves with, with worldly forms of power. They were in fact to remain as harmless as does, as it says here, but this word shrewd translates to being as wise as serpents. Serpents are snakes and they have to be wise because they're on the ground. And so they have a wisdom in their actions. So you can find this statement a bit curious or odd, but wisdom will keep them from attracting unnecessary trouble and reveal to them how to avoid it without compromise. You'll notice snakes are conforming to their environment. So they're different colors, they'll wrap themselves around tree limbs, etc., and you often cannot see them at all. So serpents are attacked by everyone. Why? Because none of us seem to like them. Therefore, this is put forward because they must use creativity and wisdom to survive. Now, remaining as innocent as it does means that they will act in a harmless manner, which will in turn keep them from giving in to the temptation of retaliation. So first of all, he wants them to be wise and pull away and hide. And, and then if something does happen to them, he's saying to them, I don't want you to retaliate either. So as a Christian missionary, it's necessary to be wary to avoid being harmed at the same time, you need a godless mind so as not to do any harm. And this is what Jesus is coaching them on. Now he says, be on your guard, you'll be handed over to the local councils. So Jesus also warns them that men will persecute them in the civic arena, the councils, and the religious arena, the synagogues. They could expect opposition from both the city hall and the halls of religion. So in other words, no one's going to welcome them in the, these towns that they go to. The next portion of scripture says, on my account, you'll be brought before governors and kings. Now, this is quite remarkable because recognizing these disciples means that they're recognizing the influence that the gospel and the disciples have. Governors and kings will actually notice them and arrest them, bringing them to trial. Now, it's quite an extraordinary account to put forward who could have thought at that time that these despised and illiterate men, because that's what they were, could excite so much attention that they will be called upon to apologize for the profession of their faith, 
before the tribunals of the most illustrious people on earth. Because remember, they're being ruled by the Roman Empire at this point in time. Next portion of it says, as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. Because they were persecuted for, J for the sake of Jesus, they could be a testimony to both religious and civic persecutors. The specific mention of Gentiles here suggests that the wider mission to include the salvation of the Gentiles is actually already in the view of Jesus, but he's just told them that he wants them to go to the lost sheep of Israel first. Okay, let's now go to the next portion of scripture, Matthew chapter 10, verses 19 to 20. And in this portion, we hear how God will defend the disciples of Jesus when they're brought before the rulers. And it reads, But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time you will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. There's a great word for us tonight. When we're before others, do not worry about what to say and how to say it. You will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking. Okay, so the first portion, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. The disciples of Jesus could have perfect trust in God in that moment, knowing that he would speak through them even if they were unprepared. We need to understand these disciples were fully convicted, so it was not the humiliation that they actually dreaded, nor even the cruel pain coming their way, but rather many of them feared their lack of skill in the use of words and defence might impede the truth. So in other words, if they don't say the right thing, there's going to be a consequence for it. But please remember, as Jesus says here, it is the promise of God that when a person is on trial for their faith, the words will come to them. So that whole notion of, oh yes, I'd like to do some missionary work or I'd like to evangelise, but I don't know what to say. And so the Lord promises us that the words will come to them through him. Now the portion that says at that time you'll, you'll be given what to say, this gave the disciples confidence because if they're being sent out and they're probably in the back of their mind going, wow, Jesus has taught us so much, how are we going to remember everything? What if we get it wrong? We can't read the scriptures. So all that sort of processing they would have been going through, they're now being given confidence to say, don't worry about it when you're in the moment. The Father will give you what you need to say. So this, however, doesn't justify poor preparation for teaching or preaching God's word, but it is rather a promise of strength and guidance for those who will be persecuted when they have an opportunity to testify of Jesus. Who knows, you might learn your stuff and know what you're saying, right? And you go and say it to someone and then they challenge you with a question. And you go, uh, how do I answer that? So this is that example where the Father will provide you with the answer. So in other words, you're still to prepare because you need to have the knowledge, but when you're challenged and you're not sure what to say, it says the Lord will give you what you actually need. Now, you should take this message to heart. I personally always recommend before you speak that you should take a moment to pray to the Father and that you ask him for two things. One is wisdom. And the second is guidance as to what to say. You know, sometimes we might go into someone's home and they're not well. And you think, oh my goodness, I've never met this person before. What am I going to say? What am I going to do? The answer is to pray to God before you go into the house. And in that moment, you'll know exactly what to say and what to do. That's a personal experience of mine. And that's what I practice. Um, okay, so let's, re let's now read verses 21 to 23. And in this portion, we hear about the dire extent of the persecution. As I said, there's a lot about persecution in this chapter. It's a big issue because it stops people from doing things. If they're worried about what people will say, what they'll do, they don't choose to do things. So Jesus covers it all off before they actually leave. And Jesus says to them, Brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by everyone because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. 
Truly I tell you, you will not finish going through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Now you might recall, if you've read your Bible, that Jesus often leaves when he's been persecuted himself. And so we're going to speak about why that is. Because he does t- he just told us, doesn't he? He said, don't stand there and fight. All right? So, in other words, if you're going to do his work and people aren't going to listen to you, he's telling you, don't stand there and be a martyr. Leave so you live for another day and you can continue to do the Lord's work for other people. So Jesus knew that the gospel will divide family members and that some of the most bitter persecution would take place among families and he said quite plainly that persecution would sometimes result in death itself. It is worth noting here that although many Christians have endured persecution in economic or social arenas through the centuries, literally millions have given their lives and faith to Jesus. It's an extraordinary testament. In verse 22, Jesus says, You will be hated by everyone because of me. So this has certainly been true, even to the degree where entire cultures have hated followers of Jesus. It seems strange that people who live by the kingdom expectations of Matthew chapter 5 to 7 should be so greatly hated. But it is the same paradox that inspired the world to condemn and crucify the only sinless man ever to live. And we talk about Matthew 5 to 7 because he talks about, for example, the Beatitudes. You know, what does he tell us? He tells us to love our neighbour, to take care of people, do all these things for others. And yet people hate Christians for this very purpose. So Jesus then says, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. A commitment to endure to the end is required for those who will weather the storms of persecution. It is a reality that those of us who face little real persecution have little understanding of just how difficult it can be to endure. It's all right to say something, but to experience it is another thing altogether. Now this is interesting. In verse 23, Jesus says, When you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. So what is he saying here? I did mention it already, so I won't pose it as a separate question. But Jesus is teaching his disciples that it's actually wrong to court martyrdom. There's other religions who actually say that if they're martyred, they will go to God. And that they will have, what, 70 virgins and all this nonsense. So they actually glorify martyrdom and yet God the Son here on earth says it's wrong to court martyrdom. So they were not to run towards persecution or even remain if they had a chance for an honourable escape. If they could flee to another place, he instructed them to do so. How many times did Paul flee and escape? His whole ministry was fleeing and escaping. They thought they killed him more than once. And he got up again, but he didn't go back. We did once. And most of the time he would head down the road and he would continue on. And so that means he still has purpose and function to go forwards. Now I do have a question for you. It's a bit of a juicy question. In the second part of verse 23, Jesus says, Truly I tell you. You will not finish going through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. What do you think this means? You will not finish. So he's speaking to the 12 disciples who he's sending out. He says, you will not finish going through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Surely, isn't it the Son of Man who's sending them out? So what can this mean? Is he talking about the future as well? Well, it has to be in this case, because he's already present. But in other words, his disciples, as in people of now even? No, he's talking to the 12 disciples here. He says they won't get to all the different towns or cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Oh, so that he means after the resurrection then? Right, but before something else that's going to happen. 
It says an ultimate judgment that happens to Israel. And it took 2,000 years before it repaired itself back to the present day. Am I giving enough information for that one yet? No? Okay. This is actually deemed as one of the hardest to understand statements that Jesus makes in the book of Matthew. Can Jesus mean he'll return to the earth before the disciples would make it through all of the towns of Israel? I mean, he was resurrected, right? But what happened when he was resurrected? He remained for 40 days and then he went to heaven. He didn't come back. So it's not that. Right? So that's the curious part. So it clearly didn't happen. So instead, his coming actually refers to his coming in judgment upon Judea. And this happens in AD 70, which is the fulfillment of the day of judgment that's warned about in Matthew 10 verse 15. The judgment was poured out by God upon Judea through the Roman armies, which did happen before the gospel came to every town in Israel. So in other words, the Romans were an extension of God's justice against his people who had walked away from him yet again. And we see this over and over in the time of history. Now they obviously went off into the diaspora as it's known and they didn't return until 70 odd years ago. And so we see in this that uh, that, is the, that is the outcome. So Jesus is talking to the disciples in the present of something that will happen during the course of their lifetime. And so this, of course, is the Romans who will come and remove, basically, or kill all of the lost sheep of Israel. So this is what it's talking about. Okay. So in other words, the disciples, and this is what the, we could compare it back to, the disciples are being sent out with an instruction to go to every town. But the reality is they will not finish evangelizing every town before the Son of Man comes in judgment against Israel. All right, let's now move to verses 24 to 25 to learn why the disciples of Jesus should expect persecution. How many people are still going out <laughs> to evangelize after what Jesus has to say to these, these disciples? Okay, so he says here, the student is not above the teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for students to be like their teachers and servants like their masters. If the head of the house has been called Beelzebul, how much more the members of his household? Now it says here, if the head of the house has been called, who's the head of the house that's been referred to here? Satan. No, it says, the head of the house has been called uh, Beelzebul. Who was called Beelzebul? Jesus was. Yeah, so I've actually already covered that in this book. Okay. So he got told that he was Satan. Why? Because he was seen casting out oh, of yeah. demons. Yeah. Okay. Right? And so the Pharisees who were following him around yeah. said, you're Satan. Yeah. And so he refers to that here in the scripture. So simply put, the disciples should not expect to be treated any better than Jesus was treated. As I said, Jesus himself was called Satan, this word form being Beelzebub. Now this already is the second reference in Matthew we have of, of Jesus being associated with Satan by his enemies. The previous one was in Matthew 9 verse 34, suggesting that it was a frequent slur. You have to realise that people, and this is for all of us, may call you what they like, but they cannot make you evil by what they call you. Right? It's an action that you perform. God the Father was actually slandered and Christ the Son was actually slandered, so how can you and I hope to escape? It doesn't make them evil, it doesn't make us evil either. People can call us names. Now verse 25 says, It is enough for students to be like their teachers and servants like their masters. So this is the goal of both the disciple and the servant of Jesus. You should want to be like your teacher and your master. Romans 8 verse 29 says that you are conformed to the image of his son, meaning of course God's son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. All right. Now let's go to the next portion, Matthew chapter 10, verse 26 to 31. I said it's a large chapter, but you can see it's all structured together. So we're going to be finished this soon. 
Now, Matthew 10, verses 26 to 31, in this we learn how, even in the midst of persecution, the disciples of Jesus should not fear but be as bold as they proclaim or preach the gospel. And it, so Jesus says, So do not be afraid of them, for there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. Remember, Jesus had the lady who came in, touched his cloak and spoke to herself, if only I can touch his robe, I will be healed. She didn't want anyone to see her because she was deemed unclean under Jewish law and she would have been stoned to death. And yet when Jesus knew that she was there, even though he didn't see her, he turned around and he said, by your faith you shall be healed. And he pronounced this publicly to everyone who can no longer stone her because she's now clean. She's been healed. But he does it publicly. And so he says the same thing here. He says that even when something's whispered in your ear, proclaim from the ruse. It's like someone says, let me tell you a secret. And you go, oh, did you just see such and such? <laughs> and you go, don't you? shh. Yeah. So people shouldn't say things to you that they don't want other people to hear. But Jesus tells us to proclaim it. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are um, not two parrot sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid, you are worth more than many sparrows. So we know from this that God knows each of us intimately. He loves us as we get older because it doesn't take as long to count the hairs on our head. Right? But he knows how many are there. The disciples of Jesus could have confidence that the truth would prevail. So they should go out and preach it with boldness despite the danger of persecution. We have to realise here that if persecution or the threat of persecution makes us draw back from speaking or preaching God's word, then Satan has already won his victory. His threat of persecution may not actually succeed in harming us, but rather cause us to hold back the word of God. How many times in life do we not do something in the fear that something will happen, whether, we, whether it will happen or not? But just the, the very notion that something could come against you will stop most people in their tracks. That's the power of fear. And so he tells us here that his threat of persecution may not actually have any harming effect on us whatsoever, but... The purpose of the threat is to stop us from uttering the word of God. So Jesus promises his persecuted followers that the truth of their honourable sacrifice will be known, even if the persecutors do their best to hide it among the pages of history. God will reveal all and justify his servants and reveal the crime of those who thought they had hidden it. Just remember that the judgment of eternity should give you great confidence in God's ultimate justice. Those who seem to cheat justice on earth will not be able to cheat justice in eternity. One of the common questions, if God is real, why does he let bad people have good outcomes? But there'll come a day where if you've been persecuted and had a rough time, you'll be okay, but they won't. You won't see it now, but it's forever. And so we must remember this as we go through our life. Now Jesus says in verse 27, what I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim or preach from the roofs. And the message of Jesus was gloriously public. That's the whole point. He went out to preach. It was not for a secret few and was not to be hidden in any way. There isn't one message for an inner circle and another for those who are on the outside. The message is universal for all. Jesus goes on to say in verse 28, Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. So God is the only one for us to fear, not the men who persecute followers of Jesus. The worst they can do is destroy the body, which obviously when we're a living being is something that we don't want to happen. But being a coward before God can have eternal consequences. So in other words, if you take the wrong choice based on this, then not only will the perpetrator have a consequence with God, but you will as well. 
We learn here that our body and our soul are separate and distinct. He makes it clear here that the body may be killed, but the soul can escape. And secondly, the murderers of the body are not able to kill the soul. Okay, they have no power over your soul. They can have power over flesh. They killed Jesus, didn't they? But they, they, they obviously didn't kill his spirit. They didn't kill his soul. Okay, verse 29 says, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? The disciples of Jesus didn't need to be afraid because God really did care for them, even down to the most minute detail. If God cares for the sparrows and numbers the very hairs of your head, then he will also pay careful attention to your needs. This is the message. The persecuted easily feel that God forgets them, but he has not. Don't be afraid, you might notice here, when we're reading this passage and the book of Matthew, is repeated again and again and again. Obviously, being afraid is a common thing that we experience. But this is the third, the third time in six verses that the disciples and us are bid to banish what we call a causeless, fruitless, harmful, sinful fear of men. Don't be afraid. He that fears God need fear no one else. All right, so very a lot of uh, good, good messages out of this scripture. Okay, let's now read verses 32 to 39 and in this portion the second last portion for this chapter we're going to hear about the attitude that the disciples of Jesus must be equipped with so we now start talking about their attitude Jesus says whoever acknowledges me before others I will also acknowledge before my father in heaven paint that picture in your mind in the book of Revelation that the lamb who was slain is before the throne of God between you and the Father, representing you. He says here, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. So in other words, he's going to stand for you. But you have to stand for him first. You're in a contract. As they say in Hebrew, it's Brit. It's a contract. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. That's not going to be good. Because then you're up for judgment. That's it. Verse 34. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to earth. Another strong statement. Sounds like he's out to fight, right? I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against his, her mother, a daughter-in-law against a mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Very disturbing thing to say in reality we all want our families to remain one unit to love one another unconditionally but what we believe and what we practice in life separates us and Jesus mentions this about being cleaved by a sword and remember he's sending the disciples out to Jews so when they go in their houses some are going to go yay and some are going to go I'm going to kill you if you believe him yeah. this is the situation that's going on there Verse 37, anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. So there's another message for all of us. We have to place our Lord first before our own partners in life, before our own parents. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. And so we're talking about this juxtaposed situation of eternal life versus our earthly life. If we lose one, we will gain the other. So the disciples must confess Jesus through this message publicly before others. If you will not be public about your allegiance to him, you cannot expect him to be public about his allegiance to you. Take note that everyone Jesus called, he called publicly. So when he went to the disciples and he said, come follow me, he was out and about. He wasn't in a room saying, come and have a private meeting. He was not there to hide anything. 
In other words, there is really no such thing as a secret Christian. Each Christian's life should supply enough evidence that can be seen by the world that they are indeed Christians. Ask yourself, how would you stand before the Lord? With an outward Christian identity or no? Whatever Jesus is to you here on earth, you will be to him on the day of judgment. There's something to think about. People like to design their Lord. Whoever Jesus is here to you on earth is what you will be to him on the day of judgment. And so we really need to think about how we walk our faith in our life. If he be dear and precious to you, you will be precious and dear to him. If you thought everything of him, he will think everything of you. Do not miss that Jesus here claims that one's eternal destiny depends upon their response to him. In other words, our faith isn't about those around us. It's about him. Okay, the next portion of scripture says, Do not suppose that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. So this message of Jesus is reflected in the Sermon on the Mount is indeed a message of peace. Yet since it calls the individual to a radical commitment to Jesus himself, it is a message of peace that will divide between those who choose it and those who reject it. So Jesus isn't setting out to have those who follow him fight. He just knows that the division between those who choose him and those who don't will cause fighting between the people. And the persecution will come from those Jews against the Christians, not the other way around. He says, For I have come to turn a man against his father, and a man's enemies will be those of his own household. So the dividing line, the sword between those who accept Jesus and those who reject him, will run through families as well. And of course that's true to this day. It's a very challenging thing. If we have three kids, we want all three of our kids to know the Lord and to walk with the Lord, right? But rarely happens, unfortunately. Okay, anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Again, strong words. Jesus explains the disciple must love and follow him before all else. Your devotion to Jesus must come above even your own household. We should expect that following Jesus will make us better husbands, fathers, wives, mothers, sons, daughters, and so on. Yet there are times when the presence of Jesus will divide rather than unify and boy, do I know this as a parent. Because yeah. <laughs> you hear it back from your kids at times. Oh yeah, but that's because you believe. What about if I don't believe it? It's just like, well, these are. I'm not teaching you or asking you to do something from my words. This is what the Lord wants you to do. And so this is where rebellion often comes from. Now it may seem odd, but the greatest danger of idolatry can come not from what is bad, but from what is good. And this is a strong point loving family relationships because the greatest danger to be the best comes from second best in other words we want our family to be the best we want to place them first rather than the lord and so we have to be very careful the disciple must follow jesus even to the place of taking their cross when a person took a cross in jesus day it was for one reason and one reason only and that was to die the ancient Roman cross did not negotiate, did not compromise, and did not make any deals. There was no looking back when you took up your cross, and your only hope was in a resurrected life. So his cross, your cross, isn't really your particular trial or trouble. The cross means only one thing, and that's death. And so when Jesus says, pick up your cross and follow me, he's saying, ultimately, death will come. And it does, of course, it comes to all of us. Death, but the death that he's talking about here is a spiritual message, not just a physical message. And he's talking about a death to self, meaning that we re resurrect our life to God. So we stop being selfish and placing ourselves first, and we place our Heavenly Father first. So this is the first mention of the cross in Matthew's Gospel. And it is not directly associated with the crucifixion of Jesus. Such an extreme statement, likening discipleship with the horror of crucifixion, must have jarred the disciples. Why? Because they all knew what a cross was living in these times. Crucifixion was not an uncommon sight in Roman times. 
In fact, when the Roman general Varus broke the revolt of Judas in the Galilee in 4 BC, so they would have all been around at this time, he crucified 2,000 Jews and placed the crosses by the side of the roads to Galilee. Could you imagine? One after another, 2,000 people. And so it wasn't uncommon and they knew exactly what it meant. But Jesus says, he who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. So a disciple lives in a paradox. He can only find life by losing it, and he can only live by dying. But of course we're talking about a resurrection life that can only come after we take up our cross to follow Jesus. Bearing the cross, we are to follow after Jesus. To bear a cross without following Jesus is a waste of time. A Christian who shuns the cross is no Christian, but a cross bearer who does not follow Jesus equally misses the mark. So there's no Hippocratic oath in this. It means something. All right, let's read our final portion of scripture from Matthew chapter 10. It's verses 40 to 42. And it speaks of the reward due to those in contrast to the persecutors who receive the disciples of Jesus. Jesus says, anyone who welcomes you, welcomes me. And anyone who welcomes me, welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet as a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person as a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. And if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones who is my disciple, Truly, I tell you, that person will certainly not lose their reward. Now, he starts off by saying, anyone who welcomes you welcomes me. So the good done to Jesus' disciples is as if it was good being done to Jesus himself. Because they are his representatives, that's their purpose, right? He's sending them out to carry on his ministry. So when we take care of someone who ministers on behalf of the Lord, it's as if we're taking care of the Lord himself. Now it goes on to say, whoever welcomes a prophet will receive a prophet's reward and so on for all those different categories. Righteous people, for example. Now you can share in the reward of God's servants by supporting them in their work. This is what that message is. Even seemingly insignificant works of kindness, and in this case, what's the example they give? Just giving them a cup of water. You've got to remember, these people have nothing. Jesus told them to go out with nothing. So a cup of water would be very meaningful to these people. And it's given to God's people, and of course it's meaningful in God's eyes, even if it is just a cup of water. Now the little ones, as Jesus calls them in this scripture, it doesn't mean some obtuse comment. And it literally includes all of the apostles, the prophets, and the righteous people. And they are called this because they're all targets of the world's enmity. So you can imagine when you go out by yourself or as a couple of you into another culture, another country, another town, and they come against you, you're going to be feeling very, very little. So he calls them his little ones because, what does it say in the beginning of this chapter? He says he's sending out the sheep amongst the wolves okay and so he calls them the little ones mm -hmm.